Now we're going to look at a different problem called the fixed point problem. Here we're given a function and we want to find a fixed point of that function. So it's a value of s such that g of s equals s. Now this is very strongly related to the root finding problem. In fact, we can always take a fixed point problem and transform it into a root finding problem. If you're given a g that you want to find the fixed point of, you can define a function f of x as g of x minus x, and then whenever f is equal to zero, that's the same thing as g having a fixed point. The converse is also true. If you're given f and you want to find the root of that, you can define g as x plus f of x, and then a fixed point of g is the same thing as a root of f. So the two problems are essentially equivalent. By the way, these transformations of one problem into another are not unique. And in fact, that can complicate how well the fixed point iteration that we're about to learn works. So the fixed point iteration is a simple way to try to solve the fixed point problem. You're given a function and a starting value x1, and you simply define the next value of x as the value of g at the current value of x. So we can use this to generate a sequence, x1, x2, and so on. If the sequence converges to a value r, then we can take the limit of both sides of the fixed point iteration equation, and we show that r is equal to g of r. So if the limit exists, it must be a fixed point. But we can actually say more about how quickly we converge to that fixed point. We do that by defining a new sequence of errors. That's the difference between the xk and the final value r of the fixed point. So then we start with the fixed point equation, iteration equation, subtract r from both sides, and then we get rid of the x's and write it in terms of the e's instead. This g value we're going to apply Taylor's theorem to, so we expand around the point r, and then since r is a fixed point, we know that g of r and r cancel out. So what we're left with is that the error at step k plus 1 is g prime of r times the error at step k plus some higher order terms. And if the error is small, then we can ignore those higher order terms because squaring them makes them even smaller. And so we just get this simple relationship between the errors at one step and the next. Therefore, if this number g prime of r is less than 1 in magnitude, then the next error is going to be smaller than the current error. This is what we call linear convergence. ek plus 1 is approximately a constant times ek, where that constant is less than 1 in magnitude. We'll call that number sigma. And if we want to be more formal about things, we look at the ratio of successive errors, and you can show that that must approach sigma as k goes to infinity. And this is what we mean as the definition of linear convergence. Now, where does this name linear come from? Well, let's suppose you have a sequence yk that's equal to a constant times sigma to the k. Well, then, when you take those ratios, you get sigma. So that would be perfect linear convergence. And when you take the log of both sides, you can show that the log of yk is a linear function of k, which means that if you plot it on a log linear graph, you see a straight line. And the straight line has a negative slope. Here I'm going to define a function f whose root I want to find. Since it's a polynomial, I can use the roots command instead of the f0 command. f0 is for generic functions, but roots does polynomials faster and all the roots at once. 
And so here you see I have two roots. So let's look at the let's look for the first one using the fixed point iteration. So I define a g such that whenever f is zero, g of x is equal to x. So a fixed point of g corresponds to a root of f and vice versa. And I'll start at 2.1 and I'll do the fixed point iteration 12 times. And what we see is that it does seem to be converging to the root at 2.7. If I define the error sequence and plot that on a log linear scale, then we see that after the first few iterations it settles into what looks like a perfect straight line. So that is linear convergence. The error goes down by a constant factor at each step. That factor comes from the derivative of g, so based on f and g above, I can define dg dx and evaluate that at the fixed point, and when we take the absolute value we call that sigma. So this is the amount by which error should be reduced at each step. Well, we can check that with our observations. So here I'm going to take the 9 through 12th elements of the error sequence and divide those by the 8th through 11th. I'm using element-wise division. So this gives me 9 over 8, 10 over 9, and so on. That's the ratio that should be converging to sigma in the limit, and that's what we see. So it's all very explainable. But there's another root. So we found the first one. What about the second one? Well, this time I'm going to start at 1.3, which is very close. And when I do the iterations, you see that it does not converge to that point. In fact, it looks like it might be converging to the other one. And again, this is not very mysterious. It's just because when we evaluate the derivative of g at this fixed point, we find that in magnitude it's greater than 1, and so there can be no convergence for the fixed point iteration. Now we had this condition, magnitude of g prime of r less than 1, that implies convergence for the fixed point iteration, at least if you start closely enough. This condition can be relaxed a little bit, or generalized to other situations. In math, in an analysis we call a Lipschitz condition. We say a function satisfies a Lipschitz condition if the absolute value of g of s minus g of t is less than or equal to a constant l times the absolute value of s minus t for all values of s and t in some interval or set. And then a contraction map would be the special case of a Lipschitz condition with constant less than 1. We call it a contraction map because after you apply g to all the points in the interval, all the distances between points have gotten smaller. So distances are contracting. It turns out there's a very famous theorem known as the contraction mapping theorem, which can guarantee that a fixed point exists and that the iteration will converge to it. It's a quite general theorem. It applies in higher dimensions and even in abstract vector spaces. So if we summarize the good points and the bad points of fixed point iteration on the good side of things, it's easy to use. And you may be able to get a convergence guarantee. But on the other hand, that guarantee can be hard to come by, and it might not even be true depending on your particular problem. And more to the point, that it's relatively slow compared to what we're going to do next.